Coming to arts, that's, I think it comes in two tiers. One was, the first as a child, you, you get used to being involved with uh, creative studies in school. Um, and I've always been artistically minded and sort of, I was always a drawer, I was always a maker, like I was always keeping my hands busy. I wouldn't consider myself an artist at that stage in my life. Um, I was always considered myself, I would primarily consider myself more as a maker where I just instinctively had to make something and just keep my hands busy. And my parents really, um, they really celebrated that, uh, um, us kids. Just see, just go where your heart goes and see what happens. And then, and then make sure, but if you do it, make sure you really do it well. So growing up, it was always that practice of, um, you know, if I was drawing, my parents would never say, stop drawing and, and, and do something else. It was like, here's more paper, here's more pencils, here's more crayons. I'm surprised you can draw a straight line. That sort of sensibility. And then when I finally got to school, um, there was a merging that was happening where I was interested in math and sciences, and I was, I was going to be a, I was thinking about being an architect. My father's an architect, um, and my uncle is. And I was thinking about being an engineer and an architect because there's something very intrinsically interesting about what your hands can do on a larger scale. Uh, that is sculpturesque architecture. But then as I got, went through university, I just found that with arts, you can, in art studies, you can really take the mathematical equations and sciences and, and really merge it far more creatively in the fine art practice. And it's not as limited as it was be in more restricted forms of, of architecture, engineering, and so on. So with the fine arts practice, it became so much more liquid, so much more proactive and influential and abstract and as limitless. And it was scary. Um, and, that's why, and that's why I knew this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So it's basically a kind of convergence of many things. I'm still think I'm still asking myself that: if, what is that? What is an artist? What, am I an artist? And all that. And uh, where did you then? You mentioned university. Where did you go to school? <coughs> and um, what do you think was most instrumental? I guess you've probably already talked about that. But mm -hmm. what do you think were the biggest learnings that you took away from from university? Uh, I went to my undergraduate degree. I did in uh, Illinois State University in uh, Illinois. And um, that was an introduction. So I had a double major at the time for science and arts, and then I dropped the science and went into art full time. And I found that to be very, um, what I think what really grasped me, like really, what really got me into it full force was the fact that how interdisciplinary it was. And I had professors who, would, who were not part of as much as the, the modern aesthetic where you focus on one thing and do it well, they're like, okay, you're in painting right now, go, go to glass and see what you can do with glass, or go to sculpture and see what you can do with sculpture, then bring that back into painting, or bring that into printmaking. So I was very fortunate at that time to have professors who were really going against the grain, um, and now we speak of interdisciplinary uh, on a academic level considerably, but in the time I was in school, it really was at, I think, the beginning stages of that conversation. Um, later on, I took six years off from school um, and experienced life outside of academia and what a fine art practice, is, an independent studio practice is. And I probably learned more uh, in that world than I did in, in, in how to be an artist, how to thrive and how to survive. Um, the limitations that you incur, but then also, I mean, uh, financially, spiritually, mentally, um, all these things while trying to sustain a practice. Um, but then eventually, I decided to go back to my degree six years later, and then went to get my MFA at uh, U of A, Alberta, in Edmonton, and, uh, and focused on print. Um, and, and then I haven't looked back since. I've been in Canada ever since. So it's been nine years in Canada. Where do you teach? I teach at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec. Um, I, I teach, uh, I'm a full-time uh, 
tenure track professor in print, ma uh, print media, specializing in interdisciplinarity, uh, uh, um, MFA studies, and um, etching. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a mouthful. <laughs> Part of it was that background and looking at looking at my father and my uncle's drafting table and seeing these two-dimensional designs, which are blueprints for <clears throat> um, three-dimensional space. Uh, you're supposed to look at this two-dimensional space and then, and then interpolate, uh, interpret that into a three-dimensional space. And that's always puzzled me as a kid. And then and, uh, from there, went to school and Part of the, and then at interdisciplinary in, in, in uh, university. And then I've always been interested in just the physicality of paper and now how dimensional it is, not just on a flat plane. The fact that it's very performative. You fold it, you crease it, you cut it, you tear it, you roll it, you do all these things to it. And I f at, even in undergrad, I found it very limiting just to basically shove it behind a piece of plexiglass. And even then, I was still finding ways of incorporating into dimensional uh, forms and kind of asking, is this print? Is it sculpture? Uh, does it matter anymore, these definitions? And from there, since 1998, I believe, I first did my first print-based sculpture. Um, I've been c continually asking these questions about the multiple, the, the uh, identities of production, identities of mass, scale, uh, labor, of uh, dimensionality of surface, and the limitations of the material of paper, the democratic conversations that paper hold within them. Uh, globally as well as spiritually and internally and I think by dimensionalizing something as mundane as paper and then forcing it into the middle of the room it really is allowing for a greater level of questions for me uh, whether the viewer responds to that or not it's fantastic but um, as, a, as a genesis a beginning point that's some of the things I'm really intrinsically interested in as a beginning point. And then you can bring in the subject matter. I can sort of delve into you know, the subject matter of, of where I'm sort of taking the work, the, the, the private material, the public material, uh, what I'm trying to get at with the, the content, but still leave it open for the viewer to respond to with their own baggage, their own histories, their own narratives. Um, and I think that's what blending print and sculpture and installation and performance, you really are charging and challenging so much of availability for, for everybody, for the, the content of the room. Yeah. Uh, my day is pretty, I'm a laborer, uh, I'm a maker. Uh, I, I get up at probably 5 o'clock, 5.30 every morning. I try to at least sometimes, sometimes I sleep until about 6, 6.30. Uh, and I just start kind of thinking and writing and, um, and sort of distributing my day mentally, getting prepped in a sense. Some days I'll have classes, so I know I have to go there, but if, if I'm in my studio practice, I usually just start immediately get in the studio after a pot of coffee and, uh, or a run and just start sort of manipulating surfaces and materials, see what happens with it. Uh, typically, my starting point is I have, I spend a great deal of time thinking about a project. And that thinking takes uh, upwards of a couple hours to probably years. I'm working on a project now that's taken about 20 years of thinking about it before, and I'm just now engaging with it uh, for the past two years. So my, my studio practice is a lot of thinking, a lot of mental engagement, trying to figure out every single equation, every single side of the puzzle box before I can actually physically start manipulating surface. Because when I say, once I get started with manipulation and creation, that's when the multiple kicks in and I'm making thousands. And it's kind of almost similar to industry where before they can really invest heavily, 
financially as well as time, uh, counting your time into producing something, they have to figure out every little aspect of it first to make it quicker, faster, easier, cheaper. So I spend a lot of time doing that as it parallels the original content, the subject matter that I'm wanting to speak of. And then from there, I just start building and constructing. So I, I'll, on a good day, I'll be, in, if I'm, I'm making, physically making, on a good day, I'm making for about uh, 15 hours straight, um, upwards up to 18 hours. Um, just hand, either silk screening, folding, tearing, cutting. Um, sometimes I'll forget to eat lunch and eat dinner. I'll just keep, I'll just really get into that sort of mental zone. Uh, so it's kind of split up in some ways. Uh, it's, this piece is the very first piece that's sort of an introduction to this whole new body of work that I've been working on. Um, and it's going more into personal narrative. Um, for the longest time, I've shied away from personal narrative um, because I, I haven't felt that I had something really important to say um, that isn't kind of, that could, that could be construed as kind of uh, cheesy or, or emo or mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know the correct term for it. So I've always been working on work that has to do with landscape or uh, process or uh, the environment, uh, socio-political uh, concerns and so on. But with this work, I really, um, I spoke earlier of a project that I've been thinking about for about 20 years, and this is this project that I've been working on mentally for about 20 years, and it's more about personal narrative and, and memory of my grandparents, memory of my family, memory of, of the, the identity of, of generations and histories of what you, what you physically and mentally sustain from uh, gain and loss and production and practice, all these sort of things that are life, life, life trends. And For Whom You Build was a project that I've been working on um, in relation to this greater body of work. The body of work has to do with um, um, trying to understand and interpret um, narratives that exist um, from multiple generations in my family. And this one specifically comes from uh, my grandparents' house. And growing up there and being really interested in that sort of environment because it's kind of alien at a point, but it's also kind of magical. When you're a five-year-old to a 10-year-old age, you're just wandering around picking up things. And you find things that aren't yours, but you kind of are interested in, in a really weird way. And, but eventually those people pass and they go into the ether and you try to, and, and you know of them in a certain content, a certain way. And a lot of it has to do with narratives, how your parents tell you about these people, kind of like storylines, storytelling, and whether they're true or not, how false they are, how true they are, how whimsical they are, they become part of your, your body, part of your entity. And part of this project comes from me sort of regurgitating these stories, but memory, uh, through uh, memory and, and these objects I, f I would find in my grandfather's shed or my grandmother's house, uh, things that would be left over, these residues. And one of it was um, I was always, as a kid, interested in climbing things, and there was this pile of bricks in, my, in the backyard. And I've always been interested in this pile of bricks, not as e economically how much they're worth or you know um, the value of them, but more as uh, like what were they for? What, my, what was my grandfather saving them for? Because like, I know he built the house that they lived in, and so. He was saving them for a reason, but when he, and he died when I was five. So it's sort of like my grandmother left him there. And I, and I still have these really stark memories of growing up playing with them, building and sort of making little brick houses with them and so on. 
So I found these, real, uh, and I just keep on thinking about this, and a lot of the work about this exhibition I'm working on, this greater exhibition, has to do with these, these narratives, these reconstructing these environments, reconstructing these, uh, these, pa these very significant passages of time um, that are, that has a sense of whimsy, a sense of openness, um, a sense where you're not sure where it's coming from, but you, the viewer, can really find your own content in. And that sense of mystery where, through the physicality of moving something and, and the objectness of it, I feel as a viewer that I can create my own narrative, my own storyline. And uh, that's just, I mean, it's, some, it's something this, this greater project I've been, again, working on for the past 20 years is finding, trying to find a way to include the viewer and not make them separate. As I'm looking at art, so I shouldn't touch it, but I'm looking at art, I think, at least I think I am. And, but I kind of want to play with it. I kind of want to be a child again, but I'm, like all these confusing, all these traits that I'm trying to build into the work. And um, I think this piece, For Whom You Build, is that the, the quote, the, 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 the title of this is really asking that question, who are you building this for? Who am I building this for? Is it for my grandfather? Is it for me? Is it for the viewer? It, do, I want, do I want people to know who my grandfather was when I didn't know who he was? All these sort of traits. Um, and so I, it's an open question. It's a very stated question at the same time. And it kind of goes with the work. The work is, and the work is in some level of production. There's all kinds of identities going with it and these steps that are occurring. So it's an active space as well as an active title.